So we're now ready to turn our attention from streams and parallel streams, which are effectively synchronous ways or largely synchronous ways of doing communication with functional programming. And in the case of parallel streams, a parallel synchronous way of doing communication and, and, and uh, computations in functional programming. We're now going to start turning our attention to reactive programming. And this will be what we'll cover predominantly the rest of the semester. And we're going to start by talking about an overview of reactive programming principles. And you'll see very quickly here that there are four primary principles that underlie so-called reactive programming, which will be responsiveness, resilience, elasticity, and message-driven. So reactive programming is essentially a paradigm for asynchronous programming, which we really haven't talked much about yet, that's concerned with processing streams of data and propagating changes from publishers to one or more subscribers. Or it could be zero or more subscribers for that matter, but typically it's from publisher to subscriber or subscribers. Reactive programming is particularly useful to support certain kinds of scenarios or certain kinds of use cases. One which is very popular, and especially if you do Android programming, which you may run across, is to handle user events in the context of some kind of graphical user interface. So these would include things like mouse movements, mouse clicks, if you're using more traditional forms of computing, like a, a laptop or a desktop that has a mouse. Touch events, if you're using a mobile device that has a touch screen or a touch pad on your laptop. GPS location signals, all kinds of things that might come in and need to be handled in order to interact with the user or that are driven by user interactions. The second type of scenario where reactive programming is particularly useful is responding to and processing latency-bound I.O. events, in particular handling any kind of asynchronous network input and output. So here's a very simple example that we'll explore in other contexts later, where you might have a bunch of Twitter messages, and those are coming into some server from a Twitter feed, and so that's a stream of events, and it comes into a server which may want to do various types of filtering, maybe some kind of analysis like sentiment analysis or people happy or sad that Alabama w won or lost the moment they lost. So Alabama fans are sad. Everybody else is probably happy. And then you want to be able to disseminate those results to different groups that may be interested. You might have some, some people who are sad that Alabama lost, so you want to send them you know, their condolences. You might have other people who are happy that Alabama lost. You want to send them like uh, some kind of congratulations message, whatever you're doing that gets sent out to the observers or the subscribers. So that's an example of network information coming in and you want to be able to handle all that in an asynchronous way. Reactive programming is based on four key principles and this is all part of the so-called reactive manifesto. You, you can't be taking yourself seriously enough until you have a manifesto like the communist manifesto or the GNU manifesto. That says you're serious about your perspective and you're going to be very opinionated and have uh, make a stand. So there's a reactive manifesto as well that you should take a look at if you're interested. And you can see that there's these four key principles. So let's talk about each one of them in turn. We'll start out with responsive. So responsive is intended to ensure that you have a rapid and consistent response time or response times to process events that are coming into the system. And what you want to do here is that basically establish some kind of reliable or fairly reliable upper bounds on how long it takes to process the events in order to deliver, deliver consistent quality of service and prevent undue delays. So we don't want things where you're taking a long time to process stuff. We want stuff to be responsive. You don't want to have the dreaded hourglass or the spinning wheel that indicates things are taking a long time to run. The next thing you're doing here, next principle that's important, is resilience. And the idea is that the system remains responsive even in the, the face of failure or at least partial failure. Obviously, if, the, you know, if you experience a power grid outage or the entire network goes down because someone cuts an a, a underground cable with a backhoe or something like that, then you may not be able to recover. But you'd like things to work as long as it's just some pieces of the computations that are failing. So in other words, failing, failure of some operations or a 
few operations shouldn't bring the entire system down. So that's the concept of resilience. Another important concept is, is elasticity or elastic. That's the, the other principle, elastic, which means the system should remain responsive, going back to our earlier principle, even as the workload goes up and down, especially as it goes up. When the workload goes down, it's, it's easy to be responsive when you've got less work. It's a lot harder to be responsive when you have more work. And in particular, we'd like to be able to come up with some way to auto-scale performance. And there's a bunch of different dimensions to auto-scaling. At the very least here, what we're thinking about is we'd like to be able to take advantage of multiple cores if multiple cores exist. And then the final principle here that is part of the reactive manifesto is message-driven, which means that the system should be structured architecturally according to asynchronous message passing, which means that you send a message, but you don't wait for the message to be delivered, much like when you send something through the postal service, you don't stand by your mailbox waiting for the response to come back. You send the message, and then at some point you get a response, perhaps. And this type of approach, this message-driven approach, gives you loose coupling. Things aren't tightly coupled. They, they're intended to be kind of sending messages asynchronously and getting responses back at some point. Isolation, you don't have to have things all running in the same address space. You can pass messages between address spaces. And location transparent, you don't know whether it's on your same computer, on somebody else's computer, on your computer in a different process. All those things become implementation details and configuration details. In a sense, this principle is slightly different from the other ones because it's an implementation detail. The other three are more like concepts. This principle is an implementation detail. We use messaging as the means for communication. Yeah, so the question basically is how do we get things to be responsive? And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into the more details. But in a nutshell, the idea of responsiveness in this context is to not block and then to arrange that if after a certain amount of time passes without getting a response, there's some way of automatically being able to generate a, an error message. Uh, obviously, if you're trying to communicate with something that is never going to reply either because it's gone away entirely or because the network's been partitioned or the server's down, you won't get a response, but you can still be responsive in getting some response, even if it's not the response that you would like. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And the main idea here is to make sure you're careful in not blocking and also in using threads appropriately. So that's the end of a quick overview of reactive programming principles. Now, keep in mind, we haven't really talked much about reactive programming yet, so it may not be very clear, as we were just talking about in the last question, about how we're actually going to be able to accomplish all these things, responsive, resilient, elastic, and message-driven. But as we get into this, probably by the end of the day, I will give you some examples of how reactive programming attempts to provide solutions to those various principles.